Hello and welcome to everyone. I would first like to thank the entire Dartmouth Political Union executive team for all the work that went into this event. Uh, for those that are not familiar with us, we're the premier nonpartisan club for nonpartisan discourse and bias minimization. Our speaker tonight is a man for whom an introduction is both very difficult and very easy. Noam Chomsky has authored over 150 books in politics, linguistics, philosophy, and more. His works include Hegemony or Survival, Manufacturing Consent, The New Mandarins, and many other great books. He has always been an ardent defender of his ideals, having debated Michel Foucault on human nature and defending the rights of Robert Forisson uh, regarding free speech. Even as far back as when he was a youth counselor, Professor Chomsky dissented against what he saw as uh, injustice, and he has never stopped since. Having all of this in mind, uh, in order to respect Professor Chomsky's ideals, I should note that he does not consider himself a leader. Professor Chomsky has stated on numerous occasions that real change comes from people banding together and opposing power structures that they deem unjust, and a leader would be antithetical to that. So while today's event is about Professor Chomsky's views, it is also about how you internalize them, how you think about them, and how they affect your actions in today's society. So with that being said, um, the format of this event will be a 30-minute moderator guided Q&A that will be followed by a 30-minute audience question and answer period. If you would like to ask a question to Professor Chomsky, you can use the Q&A box below and make sure to upload the questions you truly like. With that being said, Professor Chomsky, a warm welcome to the DPU. Thank you very much. Pleased to be with you. So we will jump straight into it. Um, and my first question is, um, I was wondering if you could outline your vision on how people can affect change in their society. In particular, in understanding power, you point out that attempts to change the US government will be of little effect because the true power lies in economic centers of power. Since the government is, um, or since most people think of the government as the only way to affect change, how would they do so if the government, uh, if the true power lies in corporations and the economic centers? Well, I, I don't recall the exact statement, but uh, to put it more accurately, the uh, in the U.S. system, other state capitalist societies, uh, there are many pressures on the government. In the U.S., the pressures of concentrated economic power are enormous. That's increased radically in the past 40 years. In fact, the neoliberal system of the past 40 years was effectively designed to reduce the role of government, which means the role of the population, and to increase the, the uh, power of concentrated private power that was pretty explicit from the first moment. Uh, you recall Reagan's uh, inaugural address when he said, uh, the government is not the solution, the government is the problem. Well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that decisions go away, it just means they move. Instead of moving from the government, they move somewhere else. Where's the somewhere else? concentrated private power, which has the advantage that it's unaccountable to the population. The government has a flaw from the right-wing point of view. It's partially accountable to the population. So therefore, it makes sense from the point of view of the corporate sector, the right-wing generally, 
to shift decisions from the general population to unaccountable private systems. That's the core of neoliberalism was enhanced by the pronouncement of uh, the economic guru of the system, Milton Friedman, famous article who said that the sole responsibility of corporations is to maximize profit. Anything else they do is immoral. So, which is an interesting point since uh, the right to incorporate is a gift from the public but it carries no responsibility according to the Friedman doctrine, basically neoliberal Austrian doctrine. Uh, so the idea is uh, power should be, decision-making should be shifted from the government, which is at least partially accountable to the population to unaccountable private hands, which have only the responsibility of enriching themselves didn't take a genius to figure out what was going to happen. We have some measures of it. Uh, Rand Corporation recently uh, tried to do a study of the transfer of wealth from the middle class and working class, lower 90% of income, transferred from them to the top fraction of 1% of the population. About their estimate is almost $50 trillion during these 40 years, which is a vast understatement. It doesn't take into account many other devices that were opened by the Reaganite neoliberal system for private power to enrich itself at the cost of the general population, tax havens, uh, rules of corporate governance, uh, all sorts of things. Well, okay, uh, what about the role of the people? It's diminished under the neoliberal systems. In fact, we have good measures of this in academic political science, which uh, give some facts. One of the several studies, uh, uh, Martin Billens, uh, Larry Bartels, uh, others have investigated a very straightforward point. Uh, to what extent are voters represented by their own representatives? It's a straightforward point, and you can measure it. We know voters' preferences from extensive polling, pretty reliable polling. We have the record of how the representatives vote, and you can ask how they correlate. Well, the basic result is... Uh, for a large majority of the population, maybe 70% or so, there's just no correlation, which means you're not represented by your own representative. It increases as you get, this is of course wealth related naturally. And uh, it, uh, uh, as you move up the wealth uh, level, you get more representation I mean, you have more power. Uh, and uh, this is quite natural under a neoliberal system. In fact, it was designed for that purpose. What it basically means is if, say, you decide to run for Congress, uh, as soon as, say, you get elected, first thing you're going to have to do is get on the phone and try to approach the donors for the next election. Because if you don't have elections in the United States, our electability is very closely correlated to campaign funding, almost a straight line, in fact. Thomas Ferguson has done the main work on this. So you get on the phone to call the donors, make sure you can placate them. And meanwhile, hordes of corporate lobbyists uh, descend on your office and talk to the staff, nice young people like you who want to do the right thing, but who are, of course, overwhelmed by the resources of the mass of corporate lobbyists. So out of that comes some legislation. We can guess what it is. And uh, the representative, when he gets off the phone, basically signs it. I mean, this is 
a bit of a caricature, but uh, not much. Well, okay, so what can we do back to that? We can change it. The government is still partially responsive to the population. It has to react to popular uh, demands. That's even true in a totalitarian state, certainly true in a partially democratic one like ours. So yes, we can move the government to take stands, which will be in opposition to the private power concentrations that are largely dominating it. And uh, we can do that. Of course, in the longer term, you could change the institutional structure so that we don't have this kind of structure. That's a long-term objective. But in the short term for immediate decisions, which are urgent, very urgent, uh, you can press for these. So let's take uh, the reconciliation plan that's right now and be being debated in Congress. Well, the right wing has, the Republican party is of course totally opposed. Uh, they don't want the Democrats to be able to pass anything that would be beneficial to the population because their goal is to retake power, blame whatever goes wrong on the Democrats. Uh, but they do have definite red lines and they've stated them. One red line is you cannot have any increase in taxes for the rich. Uh, the way it's put is that Trump's tax proposal of 2017 is sacrosanct. That was a complete scam. It, uh, you look at the details of the proposal, it uh, sharply reduced uh, taxes for the wealthy, which doesn't mean that taxes go away. It just means they transfer to the less wealthy. So it's a, another contribution to shifting the uh, burden of uh, providing government services from the rich to the poor. That's a red line, can't touch that. Well, popular pressure could change that. It's not graven in stone and there are many other cases. So popular pressure, I think it would be fair to say would arise from a public consciousness that is aware of the problems and intimately engaged with them. And I was curious to hear your thoughts. You always mention how in the 19th century, people would always consider wages um, a form of temporary slavery. Um, now that is no longer the case, and at least not widely, people don't have that philosophical understanding that you speak of. And further, the lower classes are much less edu educated than the wealthy elite. Um, so do you think that shows to a problem that is happening in society? And do you think that um, it's quite a serious one? And do you think that can be reversed? It's a very, that, yeah. Yeah. It's a very serious and important issue. So not just in the late 19th century, but for 2000 years, back to classical Greeks and Rome, the ultimate indignity, the ultimate attack on your basic human rights was to be subordinate to a master, not to be control of, in control of your own activities. Uh, that, that's, by the, that's a fundamental principle of, goes back to, Cicero, others, a uh, fundamental principle of classical liberalism. Uh, one of the last classical liberals was in fact, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, his Lincoln and his Republican party, uh, one of their slogans, principles was that wage labor is no different from slavery, except insofar as it's temporary. Now, of course, Lincoln meant by temporary, he meant you could become an individual in control of your own life. That's a narrow interpretation. The broader classical liberal picture, John Stuart Mill and others, was that you could be collectively independent, not individually. And that was the position of the American working class and American farmers, it was mostly an agricultural country then in the late 19th century. So if you look at the populist movement, not what's meant by populism today, the 
populist movement was farmers, Texas, Kansas, Oklahoma, who wanted to be free of the control of Northeastern bankers and market managers run things by themselves collectively. They looked forward to what they called a cooperative commonwealth in which uh, working people, farmers would work together collectively to run their own affairs, different from Lincoln's position. Uh, the industrial working class that was developing at the time, Eastern Massachusetts, uh, did form huge labor organizations, Knights of Labor, massive labor organizations, basically had the same position. Main thesis was those who work in the mills should own them and run them collectively, not individually. They began to move towards integration, cooperation with the radical farmers movement. If that had succeeded, we'd live in a very different country in a much more democratic country, but it was crushed by force, state and private force, plenty of violence. The US has a very violent labor history. Uh, it's unusual in the, in, the, in the character of business, dominance fighting bitter class war. So it didn't happen. But, and in fact, one of the successes of the counteroffensive is what you described. Today, the idea the 2000 year old idea that uh, subordination to a master is intolerable, that's pretty much disappeared. So nowadays people think the best thing that can happen to me if I'm a young person is to get a job. That means to spend most of my waking life as subordinate to a master. That's my goal in life. If I do that, I'm happy. That's a big change from attitudes of 2,000 years. So do you think that if there was a rise and you're a big proponent of labor unions, so this just a follow up before we go to the next question. If there was a rise in labor movements, do you think that this idea would get resurrected almost naturally? I think it's just below the surface in people's consciousness. And if the options are open, I expect, I expect, yes, there would be an outburst. This is kind of what Gramsci called mm -hmm. hegemonic common sense system of beliefs that uh, is take, so taken for granted that you never question them. But as soon as a question is raised, you see right away that they don't make any sense. Actually, this was discussed intelligently by David Hume, who we were talking about before. If you take a look at his first principles of government, one of the earliest tracks on political science in the modern sense, uh, the first paragraph opens by saying, sort of paraphrasing, it says, he is, this is very difficult. It's kind of amazing to him, he said, to see the easiness with which the many are subordinated to the few. Uh, why does this happen? He says, power is in the hands of the general population, but nevertheless, they subordinate themselves willingly to the domination of the few. He says, the only answer to this is manufacture of consent. But he says, if you can impose beliefs which people internalize, they'll subordinate themselves. That's Hume 350 years ago. It's an accurate position, and you can break through it by raising of consciousness. That's done all the time. I mean, take, say, the feminist movement, which is the most probably the most powerful popular movement that's arisen in the past 50 years or so in terms of its impact on the society. Now, how did it begin back in the 1960s? Small groups of people, mostly young women, talking to each other, saying, look, do we really have to accept the kind of subordination that's uh, 
imposed everywhere in the society, in particular in the left movement. It began with their questioning of why in the left activist movement, women had to be subordinated. It was a quite a serious issue in the 60s, expanded and so on, but it was basically consciousness raising, seeing, raising questions that hadn't been asked before. So for example, uh, if you had asked my grandmother, is she subordinated? She wouldn't even know what you're talking about. It's life, you know. That's like asking, do I breathe? Well, ask my daughters, they wouldn't even talk to you. That's so you're that talking. that actually you you touched upon the manufacture of consent, um, which is a, a very important part of your work. And I was um, wondering how that relates to, um, you know, you mentioned that it relates to perpetrating power and keeping power structures um, constant, effectively um, keeping the powerful powerful. So um, Substack now has independent reporters like Glenn Greenwald, Matt Taibbi, Aaron Mate. And I was curious to what degree do you think media networks and platforms like Substack pose a risk to the propaganda news model? Um, do you think this is an effective way to challenge the manufacture of consent? Well, it depends how it's done. Uh, media, they've greatly, the options have greatly exploded in the period of the internet and social media. They can, in principle, be used to question dominant ideas, authority, ask if it's legitimate, search for independent sources of information and analysis. All of that's possible. To a certain extent, it happens, but it's not what has come to dominate. Those opportunities have been, I wouldn't say eliminated. They're used by many people. I'm sure you use them, but many people don't. What's tended to happen as study after study demonstrates is that people tend to move into self-reinforcing bubbles. It's kind of natural, you know, I do it too. If I look for something, I tend to look at the place. I don't start by reading Breitbart in the morning. You know? And uh, we're all like that. But the effect of that is to create self-reinforcing bubbles which become more and more isolated, insulated from other opinions, often more and more extreme, divorced from reality. And uh, it's had a very harmful effect on the country to the extent that we are facing a very serious crisis. There's an interesting article in the New York Times this morning by a person who I, whose views I don't particularly admire, but his good article today, Robert Kagan, worth reading on the breakdown of the constitutional system, uh, the control of one large segment of the population by a basically proto-fascist autocrat who essentially owns the Republican Party now, the rest have capitulated and we're working hard to ensure that we will not have an elective democracy, but rather a rule by a minority uh, of uh, rural white Christian nationalist, white supremacist, uh, uh, what they call traditional values, leaving out the growing majority of the population and using any means possible to ensure that, uh, well, he's not wrong. That could be a major constitutional crisis. And a lot of that, to get back to your question, is reinforced, instigated by the tendency to move into closed, self-reinforcing bubbles. If all you hear is Sean Hannity, uh, Dr. Carlson, uh, if that's all you hear, then yes, it may look like the world is run by uh, liberal elites who want to destroy you, uh, 
of a great replacement to all the rest of it. So um, we're approaching the audience question and answer period. So I'll ask one or two more questions. Um, the, my uh, next question is, um, given that freedom of speech is a pivotal tool to any dissent and challenge to power, why do you think that US power structures have tolerated it for so long? And should we expect to see massive clampdowns on freedom of speech if there is a real move toward dismantling power structures? We shouldn't exaggerate. Freedom of speech is not established by the First Amendment. The First Amendment only talks about prior restraint. It doesn't say the government can't throw you into jail if they don't like what you said. In fact, if you look at the legal history, it wasn't until the 20th century that uh, questions of interpretation of the First Amendment, freedom of speech, reached the level of the high courts. And it began to do it mostly with dissents, uh, which were not very powerful. So we're all famous, you know, recognize uh, uh, Holmes's famous uh, statements about freedom of speech in the early part of the 20th century, but uh, less recognized is the fact that he opposed it. So in the famous Schenck case, 1917, uh, where uh, somebody was threatened and in fact punished for opposing the war, uh, Holmes, in his opinion, uh, did make some challenges about how we should be concerned with freedom of speech, but then he voted for the conviction. Uh, really wasn't until the 1960s that freedom of speech became pretty well established in the United States. In fact, a beacon to the world beyond any other country. That was in court decisions like Times v. Sullivan, Brandenburg, the Ohio set a high standard for freedom of speech. And notice that they're now under attack by the reactionary Roberts Court, which has already begun to challenge Times v. Sullivan, which established the, uh, eliminated the principle of what was called sovereign immunity. You can't criticize the holy state with words. It's a principle that still stands in Britain and Canada most other countries, Times E. Sullivan essentially shot it down for the United States that's now under attack. Uh, but it's a recent phenomenon. It has been very important. The United States has been in the lead in recent years in protecting freedom of speech. It's under threat. But that's in words. It's not been true in actions. Uh, very much to the opposite, strong opposition controls on freedom of speech shows up in many ways. But it's, an, it's a principle and an ideal which is upheld and that's valuable. And we have to work to protect it because it is under attack. Uh, take for example, the state legislation called Republican legislators all over the place, uh, passing uh, laws, dictates, a banning, discussion of what's called critical race theory. They don't have a clue what critical race theory is. It's just been turned into a chimera of some kind, you know, overthrowing uh, white Christian nationalism and getting rid of the white population, whatever craziness. But there are now bans on people teaching it. Just recently, uh, principal in the school was thrown out because he allowed discussion of critical race theory, whatever, whatever that's supposed to mean. As I say, nobody. Well, how, how grave of a threat do you think the prosecution of Julian Assange is to freedom of speech in the United States? Very serious. Julian Assange is being persecuted, practically destroyed because he released to the general population things that the government didn't want the population to know. That's the duty of a journalist. 
precise duty. And uh, you can make all kind of criticisms of the way he did it, this and that, but that's the main issue. The Obama administration, as you know, I'm sure, uh, revived the Espionage Act of 1917, which is of very dubious constitutionality and used it more than all preceding presidents combined to try to ban what are called whistleblowers, people who try to tell the population things they ought to know that the government doesn't want them to know. Uh, Obama administration decided not to extradite uh, Assange. Uh, Trump insisted, yes, has to be extradited, punished. Meanwhile, Britain has cooperated in the manner of a pure vassal by combining Assange with no charges to a, first of all, to a so-called embassy, which was really a room. I visited him there, where it, which is in many ways even worse than prison. You can't go, you don't get an hour to go outside. It kept him there for several years, then sent him to a maximum security prison, no charges notice, where he's been subjected to uh, torture, in the words of the analysis of the UN Rapporteur on Torture. Meanwhile, holding him there uh, because the US wants to extradite him, uh, an extradition means we know what a high security prison is in the United States. Well, this is criminal. And the fact that the press is not defending him is really depressing. They should be standing up for him as a exemplar of what the press ought to do. This is not to say that all of his actions are meritorious. You can make many criticisms, but this is the basic point. So before we transition to the audience and uh, audience question and answer period, I have one final quick question. And so, because this is a short interview after all, and we can't cover everything, the question is, do you have any book recommendations that will allow our viewers to better understand the levers of power and how to avoid falling under them? Uh, you know, there are books that I like, but I think everybody can find them. I mean, in my own books, there are many references. So take what we just discussed about freedom of speech in the United States. I do discuss it at length in a book, which is an interesting book, has an interesting history, a book called Necessary Illusions, which is about the US media. It was originally uh, lectures in Canada on the media. The book was a bestseller in Canada for a long time. I don't think it's ever even been mentioned in the United States about the US media. But one of the sections is a review of the history of freedom of speech in the United States. There are references there to primary sources, a place where you can look to find them. But there's a plethora of materials you can find work all over. I don't feel right in picking out particular ones. All right, uh, so with that, we are transitioning to our question and answer period. Um, and our first question is from Athena Avranti. Um, hi, uh, I guess my question is about like the relationship between technology and capitalism. Um, are you optimistic that further advances in automation will eventually lead us to some sort of post-capitalist society? Or is it more likely that we're headed to some sort of capitalist tech dystopia? Well, that question should be directed to you because you're going to decide, you and your generation could go either way. There's no technological imperative. Uh, take automation. Automation can be used to uh, eliminate meaningful work for people, uh, drive them into despair and destruction. Uh, the United States, I'm sure you know, is the only country, where only major country where uh, Mortality is, in fact, increasing. Deaths of despair, it's called. White working class, mainly. 
people in the work class ages. Uh, uh, that's one possibility. The other possibility is that automation can be used to free people from onerous, harmful, mind-destroying, dangerous work and free them to live full creative lives. In the United States, even to free them to have some leisure. The United States is different from other industrial societies in that workers are not permitted uh, leisure. There's much talk by conservative economists about how GDP is higher per capita in the United States than in Europe, which shows me must be doing something right. Mostly traces the fact we're doing something wrong, namely forcing people to work about an extra month a year. So yes, GDP goes up. Every other modern society has uh, in for legally enforced vacation time, not the US. So one of the things that autom automation could do is to leave people free to have more fulfilling, creative, independent lives, or it could be used to destroy people. Well, choice is in your hands. There's no law of nature that determines. Our next question is from Xiao Chen Shi, and apologies if I mispronounced that. Uh, if you would unmute yourself. Okay, so we will be going to Jeremy Hatfield next instead. Jeremy? Uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming, Professor Chomsky. I really appreciate you and your work. Um, my question is, what do you think of the rise of psychiatric diagnoses and the pharmaceutical treatments for them over the last 50 years? which has become a multi-billion dollar industry um, where 25% of Americans are diagnosed with mental disorder. Um, and what do you think of the framework where mental disorders are treated as individual problems rather than resulting from social systemic causes like an inability to adjust to a broken or harmful system? Well, there may be, um, there's no way to judge individual cases. There may be an individual case in which a pharmaceutical treatment uh, can be helpful and a psychiatric diagnosis, I know of such cases. But your general point, I think is very valid. We should ask the question seriously, whether the tendency to turn to these measures is a way of enforcing social control. Whereas we should be looking at the social problems that lead to these diagnoses. Give one example that I happen to have followed. A friend of mine, a distinguished neuroscientist, uh, began to study the difference in cognitive ability that's tested constantly and related to uh, so SES, socioeconomic status. Uh, she found by studying individual, these are kids who act out in school, you know, are thrown out of the room, can behavior problems, can't solve, can't learn, and so on. Well, she found that a lot of it can be traced to the fact the conditions in which they live. She found studying groups of kids that their parents, often single mothers, uh, or broken families, or live in poverty, uh, they, the parents don't read to them because they don't have time. Uh, they don't have time to talk to them. The main thing the kids hear is get out and take care of yourself in the street or something. Okay, that has an effect. She actually started groups where she brought parents and children together and tried to work with them on simple things like read your kid a story, things like that. Cognitive skills increased. She even found neurological changes. Uh, another friend of mine who's a very good cognitive scientist uh, worked in a school, moved to a school system where he was interested in dealing with 
children who are so uncontrollable that they're basically thrown out of the school system, put in special treatment and so on. He worked with them, again, like this other case, looked into it carefully. Turned out these are kids from poor families. Uh, they didn't have breakfast. Uh, they were put on a school bus where they sat for an hour till they finally got to school and they were thrown immediately into a you know, arithmetic math course or something that they were going crazy. He started working with them. He discovered, first of all, that they have low glucose levels. So he started by just giving them a piece of candy in the morning. Instead of taking them right to class, let them run around in the yard for you know, half an hour and kind of get rid of their frustrations, other things like that. In not a long time, his schools were doing better than the general public school system. Well, these are the kinds of things that matter. So going back to your question, there may well be individual cases where psychiatric diagnosis and pharmaceutical treatment is well in order. I know of such cases. There are a mass of other cases where we're throwing under the bus huge social problems that are causing major disorders, and we should be looking at them. It's gotten much worse during the neoliberal period, but one of its characteristic elements has been defunding public education, an effort to destroy public education. It's pretty open on the part of many of the advocates. Get rid of the mass public education was one of the real contributions of US democracy to international civilization back in the 19th, early 20th century. Now there's a major effort to destroy it in many ways charter schools, defunding, all sorts of other things. That's a tragedy. And it's leading to the kinds of social problems that you describe. Our next question is from Matthew Capone. And then this seems to be a linguistics uh, related question. Matthew, would you like to ask your question? Hi, Professor Chomsky. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. So I had a quick question about semantic dispersion, especially in the age of social media today. Oftentimes, the original meaning of a word can be lost, twisted, or completely distorted. And I was curious as to why that happens and if this is a threat that we should um, be aware of in the future when it comes to freedom of speech or how we express ourselves moving forward. Thank you. Well, I'm not sure whether there's anything really novel about this goes back very far. When words tend to be used uh, promiscuously uh, without care, they, you do get phenomena like semantic dispersion. Uh, sometimes it's all over political discussion, not in the modern period. So take, say, the word liberal. What does it mean? I mean, Traditionally, it meant something like classical liberal. That's not what it means now. Now that's called serious conservative, not the people who call themselves conservatives, but the serious conservatives. There's a remnant uh, would be, in effect, classical liberals. That's what liberal used to mean. In the United States today, liberal means what in Europe would be called mildly social democratic. Uh, has very little connection to its original use. Well, these are major terms of political discourse. Uh, you look beyond, you find it all over the place. It may be somewhat accelerated by the uh, social media phenomenon, but I'm not convinced that it's much of a change from the past. Our next question comes from Kevin Larkin. Kevin? Hi, Professor Hello. Chomsky. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. we can hear you. Uh, my question is, uh, what do you say to someone who prefers individual independence over collective independence whenever they conflict? Tell them that's fine. You want individual independence? Go somewhere 
where you do not benefit from the collective work of society. You want to find a plot of land in Montana, live on it, not use water that comes from the social system, not drive on roads, uh, nothing that the society offers people. That's fine, it's your choice. But to say, I want the kind of independence in which I benefit from society, but I'm not responsible to society, that's a different matter. We're seeing that right now dramatically in the case of vaccine refusal. So somebody says, I don't want to have my kids uh, go to, I don't want a requirement on my children that when they go to first grade, they have to have polio vaccines. That's individual. That's insisting not on individual independence, but on the right to harm people. I want the right to harm people. I want the right to harm the kids in first grade by sending my kid there without measles, polio vaccines, the vaccine mandates that have been in place for a long time. It's only quite recently in our, in our system of social collapse and disorder that vaccine mandates have become controversial. They've been accepted for a long time with no controversy. So to get to your question, it depends what you mean by independence. If independence means I'll act on my own, I take nothing from society, I have no responsibility to society, individual choice, that's fine. If independence means I take everything that society offers, but I have no responsibility in return, and I can even go to the extent of harming people if I like, I don't think that's acceptable. So our next question is from Kavya Nivarthi. Hi, Professor. So my question is just about the sort of growing um, populist movements in American politics today, both on the left and the right. And I'm just wondering if, you know, first of all, if you think there's any similarities between left populism today and right populism, and where, whether you think that means that the current binary we have in American politics is going to change. Well, this is a good illustration of one of the previous questions about semantic dispersion. What on earth does populism mean? Populism did have a meaning in the late 19th century. As I mentioned, populism was the a radical democratic view that uh, farmers, workers should be able to run their own collective de destinies in a cooperative commonwealth of mutual aid, cooperation, democratic participation, and so on. That's not what populism means today. What populism means is pretty hard to identify. It's something like, uh, I'm going to go my own way no matter what anybody says. It's, uh, you have it on the left and on the right. It's an antisocial phenomenon, almost the exact opposite of what it meant in the original usage. And is it uh, bringing a restructuring of American society? Very definitely. Um, there is a lot of talk about the growing polarization in American society. It's a little bit misleading. The polarization is overwhelmingly the drift of the Republican Party to the far right. If you look at international comparisons, the Republican Party is ranked along with the far right parties in Europe with neo-fascist origins. Uh, it's gone a long way. Republicans used to be part of the political system. I mean, I've voted for Republicans in the past. Uh, Republicans, what were called re moderate Republicans were often indistinguishable from liberal Democrats, had different views on certain things. Sharply changed, partly since Reagan, 
more extensively since Gingrich, who tried to organize the Republican Party as a party in opposition to governance, not to the policies of the Democratic majority, if there was one, but the governance itself. It's reached a further extreme with Mitch McConnell. When Obama was elected, McConnell said straight out, our goal is to make the country ungovernable, to make sure that Obama can't achieve anything. By now, under Trump and today, it's just become a caricature. You can't even call it a political party anymore. It's what's sometimes been called a radical insurgency. We see that in front of us every day. Sometimes, I mean, right now we see it in the insistence, 100% insistence on blocking anything that might benefit the country. Take the question of the raising the debt, the debt ceiling, which is on the order right now. In another couple of weeks, the government will have to default on its obligations. It caused an immense harm to the country, probably trillions of dollars economically, hundreds of thousands of lost jobs. The Republicans are adamant that they will not cooperate in raising it. When Trump was in office, that he spent lavishly for the benefit of the rich, uh, and caused a huge deficit. I think it was something like $8 trillion, if I remember. Well, the Democrats, being a political party, cooperated in uh, raising the debt ceiling regularly. The Republicans, now a radical insurgency, won't do it. They want to place the onus on the, Repo on the Democrats for raising the debt ceiling so that in their propaganda, they can approach the public and see, say, see these profligate Democrats spending money to destroy your future. Total cynicism, pure total cynicism, 100% support. Susan Collins, supposed to be the moderate Republican, strongly supports it. Or one of the most striking cases, dramatic ones, which hasn't been covered in the media, is what happened with the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Just take a look at the facts. February 2020, Trump made a deal with the Taliban in which he totally sold out the Afghan government and of course the Afghan population. Total betrayal. They said, we're just gonna leave in May 2021, the onset of the fighting season, and you, the Taliban, can do whatever you like. No conditions. Only condition is don't shoot at American soldiers because that won't look good for me. But anything you want to do to the Afghans, be free. Total betrayal. How did the Republican organization respond to this? By praising this historic, brilliant achievement of our great master, Donald Trump. In fact, you can find that on the Republican webpage. Republican Party webpage up until the moment when the withdrawal started to become a catastrophe. Then they pulled it off the webpage and turned to denouncing Trump, calling for his impeachment, uh, hysteria from Josh Hawley and the rest of them. What for? For implementing a policy that was less destructive than the one they had advocated triumphantly uh, with fulsome praise for their leaders. If you can find a case of cynicism and hypocrisy deeper than this, I'd like to see it. And this is now characteristic of the Republican radical insurgency. Shows up in the legislative attempts to prevent majorities from winning elections from all sorts of things. It's not a political party anymore. So that's caused divisiveness. That's an overwhelming cause of divisiveness. Now among the Democrats, the Democrats are called progressives, of the Sanders movement primarily. Now they have moved somewhat towards 
what's called the left. So that increases the divisiveness. But take a look at their stance. Uh, one of the editors of the London Financial Times, the world's major business journal, quipped, not entirely a joke, that if Sanders was running in Germany, he could be running on the ticket of the right-wing Christian Democrat Party, which is in fact correct. His major proposals, universal health care, free higher education, they don't even talk about it in Germany, obviously. Uh, in fact, in most of the world, the United States is way off the spectrum. It has the worst health system among developed countries, not my judgment, the judgment of the Commonwealth Fund, which monitors these things, way high, greater expenses, and much worse outcomes in most cases, uh, because it's a business run society. The healthcare system is run for profit, not for health. Okay, that's what you get. Uh, free higher education, you find almost everywhere. Most of Europe, Mexico, you know. So to call for these common things is called maybe too radical for the American people. It tells you something about our society and where it's gotten, particularly under the neoliberal assault, which drove it radically in this direction. So is there polarization? Yes, but take a look at what it is. Uh, as, uh, 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 is it, uh, as for populism, Try to, try to define it. It's not a coherent position. And it has almost nothing to do with what it meant in the period of real populist activity and the populist movement. Professor Chomsky, I know we're a little bit over and you're a busy man. So if you have the time for one final question, then we can ask that and otherwise we can end it. It's up to you. Are you okay with one more question? Hello, Professor Chomsky. Should I just read it? Oh, it's up to you. Uh, if you're okay with one more question, I'll just invite this. The, okay. Fine. Our final question is from Camila Katsis. Camila? Good afternoon, Professor Chomsky. My question is, what would your suggestion be for young people on how to spend their time doing, um, like during their breaks from education or after graduation? considering the fear of falling behind their peers if they do not dive headfirst into the workforce? Well, that's for them to choose. You have a choice. Uh, first, look at the real world. That's a good start. In the real world, your generation is facing problems that have never arisen in human history. Never. Problems of whether organized society can survive. That's a very real problem and it has to be answered now. Well, several such crises are converging. One of them is heating of the environment. I presume you've looked at the IPCC report that came out a couple of weeks ago, August 9th. It's the latest of a series of reports from the global scientific community, much more dire than preceding ones. It warned very realistically that unless we take urgent measures to stop fossil fuel production step by step, so that by about mid-century essentially finished, unless we do that, we will reach irreversible tipping points, for, which doesn't mean everybody's going to die tomorrow, but will be on an irreversible course towards the destruction of organized human society and millions of other species that we're destroying at an incredible rate, hasn't been seen for 65 million years. That's in addition to the sharply increasing threat of nuclear warfare, which could virtually be ter terminal at any moment. 
Those are serious threats that cannot be avoided. There are others, like the threat of a future pandemic which will be much worse, could very well be much worse than this one. In the current pandemic, the United States has already passed the number of deaths from the huge flu epidemic a century ago. Seven, 800,000 people, if you look at the actual numbers, almost all unnecessary deaths could have been stopped. We knew how to stop it, didn't implement it. Okay. Hundreds of thousands of people murdered. It's going to continue. Well, and it's going to get worse if the virus mutates further by lack of vaccination. Could get to uncontrollable ones. There's others. <laughs> but the general point is the your generation is facing a choice. And you put it very well in your question. Do each one has to ask, do I want to make sure I get ahead in uh, whatever profession or whatever I'm entering in? Or do I want to put efforts into saving human society and millions of other species from destruction? And it's actually not a choice because you can do both. It's perfectly, nobody works full time in political activism even the most dedicated person. So the question is, how do you divide your time? How much do you care about personal advancement in some work environment? How much do you care about the survival of a livable society? It's an individual choice. You have to decide. I have no advice. Professor Chomsky, um, I think that's a, that answer is a great encapsulation of this entire conversation that it's, um, you're leaving us a lot to think about. And I, I think that these were very interesting questions. I, uh, and the answers were very illuminating and touched about on many things that I hope we all explore further after this event. Um, I wish to thank you first. And I would also like to thank the DPU Executive Council, William Riker, our president, Mac Rieferson, our treasurer, Selena Noor, our membership director, Sudarshan Balsubramani, our web director, and Emma Ellsbecker, our debate director. Emma, Mac, and Sudarshan were helping backstage, and I am very grateful to them. To be uh, in touch with DPU, please use any of the links that will be listed in a few seconds. And I just want to thank you again, Professor Chomsky, for talking to us, for being so generous with your time. It was quite an honor, and I'm glad that I got to talk to you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Pleasure to be with you.